I'm Jesse Waters. Midterm myths, that's the subject of tonight's Waters words. All year we heard about a blue wave. It is possible if, if there's a huge blue wave uh, that the Senate, Senate could be in play. I think you see a very large blue wave and it will have consequences in both the House and Senate. There's definitely a blue wave coming and we got to get ready for it and stop lying to ourselves. But on Tuesday night, that didn't happen. The blue wave was looking more like a smurring pea smurf that was peeing. The Democrats are having, so far, a lot of vote to come in, a disappointing night. This is not a blue wave. Uh, this is heartbreaking, though. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It's not a blue wave, but it's still a blue war. In the statewide races, no signature win for Democrats. So maybe kind of it's the red wave, <laughs> on the Senate side at least. I feel more like I got <laughs> purple rain. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the media is worse than your local weatherman. No wonder nobody trusts the press. Going on this weekend, Republicans have won three additional seats in the Senate and lost only 30 seats in the House, just half of what Obama and Clinton lost in their first midterms. Plus, Republicans won key governorships in Florida, Ohio, Iowa, and New Hampshire, critical states to hold for President Trump's reelection campaign. Well, let's look at some more propaganda that went up in smoke. The media told us that Barack Obama still had juice, but Obama still has the midterm jinx. The former president went one for five for the big ticket candidates that he campaigned for aggressively. Abrams for Georgia governor lost. Gillum for Florida governor losing. Nelson for Florida senator losing. Donnelly for Indiana senator lost. Only cinema in Arizona is barely ahead right now and that could change. Donald Trump went 9 for 11 in the big state races he rallied in during the last two weeks before the election. What about the celebrity endorsements and campaign appearances? Did those do the trick for Democrats? Stacey Abrams in Georgia, endorsed by Oprah, lost. Beto O'Rourke in Texas, endorsed by Beyonce. And LeBron James and others, lost. Andrew Gillum in Florida, endorsed by Diddy and Chelsea Handler, losing. Phil Bredesen in Tennessee, endorsed by Taylor Swift, lost. Celebrities have become the kiss of death for Democrats. Now, remember when the media told us the millennials hated Trump so much that they were going to turn out and vote in record numbers this midterm? No. Millennials made up just 12% of the electorate, the same percentage of millennials who turned out in the last two midterms. Speaking of percentages, let's look at the polls. Now, statewide polls were generally within the margin of error this year, but seemed to undercount Republicans by about 2% in key races. So let's look at the winning and losing pollsters in the big statewide matchups. Missouri. Now, Hawley won by about six points there. Now, the worst performing poll was NBC News Marist, who had McCaskill up three. And the best poll, Trafalgar Group, had Hawley plus four. And in the Florida Senate, final result there, Scott, 0.2% margin of victory and still counting. Now, the worst poll there, Quinnipiac, had Nelson up seven. The best poll again, Trafalgar Group, had Scott plus two. And the Florida governorship, DeSantis winning with about 0.7% of the vote. Worst again, Quinnipiac had Gillum up 7%. And best again, Trafalgar Group with DeSantis three points ahead. And let's take a look at Arizona and the Senate. Final result there, Cinema with about a half a percentage point victory, but that's still being counted. Worst there, NBC News Marist had Cinema up six points going into Election Day. And the best performing poll, Emerson, had Cinema up one. Taking a look at Wisconsin governors. Evers beating Walker by a little over 1%. Worst poll again, NBC News Marist had Evers plus 10. And the best performing poll there, Marquette, which had it at a tie. And there you have it, the polling team at Trafalgar Group had a great year. But the folks over at NBC News and Quinnipiac, check your samples, guys. So leading up to 2020, when the media starts tipping the scales with predictions and push polls, telling you Obama has coattails, celebrity endorsements matter, and it's the year of the millennial, take a step back and remember these words. Waters words. And hit a react. 
Donald Trump for President Advisory Board Member Gina Loudon, and Fox News National Security Strategist and author of Why We Fight Dr. Sebastian Gorka. All right, ladies, first, Gina, what do you think about Waters' words? I love them, but I also think, Jesse, it's important to note that uh, those who ran closest to the president on the Republican side of things uh, tended to win. True. And, uh, and also, and the other thing that we're seeing is that we have a total new psychology where I believe that a lot of Democrats believe it's okay to steal elections or cheat to win uh, because they believe this president is evil. And I think the psychology behind that has prompted them uh, to act in some ways that we've never seen before in elections. Yeah, and I think it that's looks making like a major they're recounting things too. now in Florida governor, Florida agriculture, uh, Florida Senate, and uh, I guess things are coming in a little late in Arizona, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, Dr. Gorka, what did you think about Waters' words and all of the myths that were exposed on Election Day? Jesse, is it not enough for you to have a world? Now you have to have words in your world as well. I want it I mean, all, Dr. Really, Gorka. I want what is it this, all. Julius Caesar? Um, look, you, you, you nailed it. And, and I'll add one thing. So uh, Obama was an albatross around the neck of the Democrat candidates. Uh, Donald Trump brought victory. And also, the most important thing, these people who had been sold to America as, as the messiahs of the Democrat Party, Beto, Gillum, what happened? Crushed. I'll give you two examples of what really was the underlying dynamic. You have people like Ron DeSantis, who I campaigned for, who cleaved to the Make America Great Again agenda, was proud of being a soldier for Donald Trump's Make America Great Again agenda, and what happens? He wins. Then you have people such as the district where I live in Virginia, Barbara Comstock, incumbent Republican Congresswoman, in her last flyer through my post box doesn't mention anywhere Donald Trump doesn't mention the last two years what happens to the incumbent rhino she gets crushed it's a great point and this look tells at, you yeah and look at the policies that these people on the left came out with not only did they run far away from the mainstream of the Democratic Party they went so far out there if you look at Stacey Abrams you look at Gillum in Florida and you look at Beto O'Rourke those are pretty red states middle of America states and Gina, they ran on gun confiscation, kneeling for the national anthem as patriotic, and socialized health care. Obviously, they went down in flames. Well, Jesse, the, the Democrats have an identity crisis. Their votes exist in the middle of the country, and their money exists on the two extreme coasts and also on Wall Street. And so when they're getting their money from Hollywood and Silicon Valley and, and Wall Street, uh, they are going to have to preach the issues that those crazy leftists espouse. Um, but they're not going to be able to attract the votes of, say, the Midwestern states or the Southern states that used to, in some cases, be traditionally Democrat. So they have a real identity crisis here, Jesse, and I don't know how they fix it. Yeah, and even the red state Senate Democrats, uh, like in Missouri with McCaskill or Braun in Indiana, Dr. Gorka, you know, they right. take all that outside money and then they pretend they're not Democrats and right. run on uh, birthplace citizenship, run on uh, even the wall and, and run way to the middle. And those people still lost. Yeah, well, thanks in part, I think, to Project Veritas and those undercover videos from O'Keefe where you see what they really mean when they're running as middle-of-the-road Democrats. But Gina's absolutely right. You, we, have to, we should get down on bended knee and thank the founding fathers for their genius. The, this is why we have the Electoral College. This is why we right. guaranteed that these urban centers that have become hives of radical left-wing politics can't dominate rural America. So whether it's 2016 or whether it's 2018, the, the Electoral College is incredibly important, and so is the system that we have. It's not first past the post. It's not this pop, the popular vote that the Democrats <laughs> yeah. are crying over. I don't even know no. what that means in no, the no, Senate. No. It, we are a republic, and God bless the Founding Fathers. Right, they have all these pockets of crazy that have a lot of influence, and then it all evens out in the end. All right, Gina, you brought up the point earlier in the segment about stealing elections and what we've seen and I'm not accusing anybody of stealing elections but I'm just saying it looks fishy down in Florida what's happening all of a sudden 
on Tuesday night, you have uh, Gillum and you have uh, Nelson, who lost, but you had Rick Scott, win by about from 60,000 votes to 80,000 votes apiece. And then as the days go on, you start coming up with new votes. Now you're looking at a woman here, uh, her name is uh, Snipe, and she's the Broward County uh, in charge of elections, uh, Brenda Snipes. Mm -hmm. And she all of a sudden has discovered tens of thousands of votes. We're counting five pages or six pages for each of the people who voted. But other counties have been able to do it. But other counties didn't have 600,000 votes out there. Well, Miami-Dade did. Well, have you been inside my Never mind. Let me go check. I'll check. I don't know where they came from. She's supposed to have reported them. We don't know about the chain of custody. And all of a sudden, these margins have shrunk to the point, Gina, where now they're triggering automatic recounts. And I'm thinking Broward County, you know, Palm Beach County is the same type of shenanigans that we saw in 2000. What do you think's going on here? Yeah, well, around here, Jesse, where I live, and we've also got this problem in Palm Beach County, but uh, Snipes has earned the uh, moniker Sneaky Snipes because there have been so many problems. Is that a Trump with, uh, nickname electric... or did she get that out her own? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm sure it's forthcoming, yeah. Jesse. Watch for <laughs> the tweet. That's a good one. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a known fact, and these problems are uh, go back with her for several years, and there have been several times where she's been in trouble for that. Why she's still there, I do not know, and I certainly hope that the Secretary Secretary of State uh, takes over this entire process because there's a lot of a lot of uh, bad things going on here. I'll tell you yeah, that you much. Mean, you, it's you it's talk known about... around Florida that this happens. Yeah. But but Jesse, I think I think one of the really important things to note here is that you know stealing elections is is evil and nobody doubts that but the left has so painted Donald Trump and his administration and even his supporters like myself as evil that anything you do to them is okay even if it's stealing elections so I think we've gone from yeah. where it's you the know, end attacking the people means. in if restaurants. If your enemy is evil then it allows exactly. you to do pretty much anything. Uh, Dr. Gorka you know <laughs> Dr. Loudon was mentioning Snipes in her history. She's been accused and I think found guilty of a few things, destroying ballots, illegally yes. posting results before polls close. She's been sued for leaving amendments off the ballot. She is probably one of the most corrupt officials in that area, and she has a bad track record. I'm not sure why she's still in charge down there. What can be done about this? Now uh, I think Rick Scott's filing a lawsuit. Yeah, I mean, Sneaky Snipes shouldn't be allowed to be county dog catcher. Um, I mean, yesterday on Friday, we had demonstrations down in Florida. Make your voice heard. Make sure that the thugs, the cheats, and the liars don't win. Think about this. It's Saturday, and there's still almost half a million votes not counted in Florida. What, what is this? Vanuatu? Are we in Venezuela? This you know, it's so funny. One of the counties that it suffered so horrifically in the hurricane got all their votes in like that. No right. problem at all. Yeah. But they're having a lot of Great trouble point. here at, at Broward. And, and Dr. Loudon, I mean, I, I thought the Democrats were very concerned about integrity of these elections, Russian <laughs> interference, you know, the, the sacred <laughs> ballot box. And now all of a sudden they're discovering thousands yeah. of ballots days after the fact. Sounds fishy. Well, yeah, Jesse, they're, they're concerned about Russian interference, but they'll create a fake Russian dossier. They're concerned about women's rights, but they'll uh, create fa false rape accusations and to try Lydon, to take of, down Kavanaugh. Dr. Ludden, speaking of uh, fake dossier, guess who the Democrats just flew down to be in charge of this election situation? Mark Elias, who is this Democratic operative that was in charge of paying for the fake dossier and hiring Christopher Steele. I mean, it's like, Jesse. where does this go now? Can, can I, can where, I, I'm gonna, is Al I'm, Gore going to come back too? I'm going to make a prediction right now. Yeah. So if, if this attempt to steal the election fail, if, if it works for the Democrats, if they steal the election in Florida, there will be no mention made of Russia ever again, ever again. <laughs> if they don't get to steal it, and the Republican wins, suddenly everybody's going to talk about Russia. They couldn't care less about the truth. It's about power. That's all it's about. All right. Doctors, I got to run. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. Are you a Trump supporter?
Are you having trouble getting a date? Now, there's a new website, Donald Daters, that's going to help you out. We'll talk to them later. But first, the White House says Acosta accosted an intern. CNN says it's fake news. The truth, next. The credentials from CNN reporter Jim Acosta after this ridiculous display at the White House on Wednesday. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to challenge you on, on one of the statements that you made in the tail end of the campaign uh, in, in the midterms. That here, this, here we go. That, well, if that's you don't done. mind, that's Mr. President, right. that this caravan was an invasion. As you know, I, Mr. President, I consider it to be an invasion. As you know, Mr. President, the caravan was not an invasion. It's a, it's a, a group of migrants moving up from Central America towards the border with the U.S. Thank you for telling and me that. I appreciate why, it. Why, did you, why did you characterize it as such? Uh, and because I consider it an invasion. You and I have a difference of opinion. But do you think that you demonized immigrants in not this at all. election no, not to at try all. I to want keep them? I want them to come into the country, but they have to come in legally. You know, they have to come in, Jim, through a process. I want it to be a process. And I want people to come in, and we need right. the people. Your you know, campaign. Wait, your campaign. Wait, wait. You know why we need the people, don't you? Yeah. Because we have hundreds of companies moving in. We need the people. Right. But your campaign had an ad showing migrants climbing over walls and well, so on. Well, that's true. It poor, it, but they it, weren't actors. They're not going to be doing they that. They weren't actors. Well, no, it's true. Do you think they were actors? Uh, they weren't actors. They didn't come from Hollywood. Right. These, were, these were people. This was an actual, you know, it happened a few days ago. And, uh, They're hundreds of miles away, though. They're hundreds and hundreds of miles away. That, that's I not an invasion. Should, honestly, uh, I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN. All right. And if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much better. If I, if I okay, may ask enough. one other question. Mr. President, if I may, if I may uh, ask Peter, one other ahead. question, are you worried? Of, that's enough. That's no, enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was going to ask one of the, the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. Um, Excuse President, me. That's enough. Mr. President, I had one other Peter, question, if I may ask, on the Russia investigation. Are you concerned that... That you may have I'm not concerned about anything with the Russian investigation because it's a hoax. Are you, That's enough. Put down the mic. Mr. President, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? Mr. President. I'll tell you what, CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. Joining me now with reaction, conservative filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza and media reporter for The Hill, Joe Concha. So I just want to start off before we get to the whole arm push, whether it was or whether it wasn't. This is the president of the United States. He's the commander in chief. And he can characterize something happening at our border however he wants. It's an invasion. It's an incursion. It's an intrusion. He has authority over the border when it comes to national security. Remember Barack Obama. Uh, in Benghazi, he said that terrorist attack was a protest over a video. Now, that was an extreme mischaracterization of the truth. And the media never challenged him on that at all. They let him slide on that. So to have Acosta come up over a difference of opinion, over a, over a choice of words, and, and try to argue with the president in such a rude and disrespectful way, I thought was uncalled for. And just yanking the press pass is basically just saying, listen, Jim, get on the timeout, cool off for a second, and we'll let you back next week. Dinesh, what do you think? Well, first of all, the exchange, this to me, was, uh, was, was highly entertaining. Uh, it reminded me of some of the skirmishes between uh, Reagan and Sam Donaldson from the old days, uh, except Reagan and Sam Donaldson were, were grown-ups. Now, the funny thing here, I think with Jim Acosta, I'd have to say, I'm looking at an overgrown infant. I, I don't know if this is medically possible that you physically grow, but emotionally you remain an infant, and intellectually, because when you're an emotional infant, you want to grab something, you don't want to stop, you don't know enough, you want another cookie, another piece of candy, and you won't take no for an answer. And the other thing is, you have a sense of entitlement and arrogance because right. you, you don't he have... He thinks he's above everybody else in that room. He thinks it's the Jim Acosta show, and he's there to trade barbs with the President of the United States. And if he gets called out for it, he's the victim. He thinks he's the Rosa Parks of the press corps, and he's too dramatic. I don't know Jim Acosta. I've never met him. He seems like a fine guy personally, but his behavior is totally out of line. And Joe, taking a press pass away isn't attacking the First Amendment. It's just telling the guy, hey, behave yourself and conduct yourself with a little bit more decorum and have a little bit more respect for the presidency.
I'm glad you played the entire clip because all I've seen is the microphone exchange. If you watch the clip, he tries to ask Acosta four different questions. The way a press conference like this works, if you're a White House correspondent, you get one question and maybe a follow-up, maybe a second question. As you said, it's not his show. There are dozens of other reporters in there, good ones, by the way. John Carl, ABC, Jeff Mason, Reuters, John Roberts from Fox News, Hallie Jackson, NBC. They're not trying to ask four questions in this, in this case. And remember the way Acosta started that. He says, I want to challenge you. And then he goes into a lecture right. around whether it's an invasion or not. This is a mid-40s version of the captain of the debate team. Right. <laughs> and that's not and look how many job. questions the president took. He took 68 questions from 35 reporters. And Dinesh, Jim Acosta just wants to monopolize the whole thing. I think if you want to go up there and ask a question, fine. If you have a follow up, see if you can squeeze it in. But to say the, to the commander in chief, you know what? I'm running the press conference. You don't get to decide when you want to move on to another reporter. I'm the one holding the mic. I get to decide when the president of the United States wants to move on to another reporter. Who does he think he is? Well, I, I think what Trump finds maddening, and this explains the sharpness of the way Trump responded, is I think Trump recognizes that this same press corps, uh, with Acosta in the lead perhaps, was just lapdog sycophantic to Obama. Right. Uh, and they are unremittingly hostile to Trump. Now, they have the right to do that, but to pretend that they're not doing that, to pretend that they're just being objective and, quote, doing their job, uh, when the transparent bias, the agenda, is so obvious to anyone watching, I think that's what Trump finds they have maddening. no credibility because they treated both presidents totally differently. And then just lastly, real quick, yeah. I guess the, the White House is being accused of altering or doctoring that video or something like that. I don't know what they did or not. All I know is that if you look at it in real time, he has the mic in the one hand and he pulls his arm down on the woman's arm and you can see it go down. So he's obviously provoking a physical confrontation. It just, I don't even think it's even the point really the, the, what happened with the microphone. This is two years of Acosta doing this. It is built to this crescendo. And let me go back to Neil Monroe. He was with The Daily Caller and he interrupted President Obama in 2012. I asked your producers to put together a couple of headlines here as far as the reaction when he interrupted the president right. once. Politico. Obama erupted, interrupted by heckling reporter. Who is Neil Monroe and why is he interrupting the president, the Atlantic? And finally, this is the best one from Mediaite. CNN White House reporter, Obama heckler, let him sound passionate. That White House reporter wasn't Jim Acosta. I don't hear anybody yeah. calling Jim Acosta a heckler now. One man's heckler is another man's hero. All right, guys, I got to run. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Up next, real news that you probably didn't hear much about this week. And later, a titanic clash between Donald Trump and Michelle Obama. Wow. The Senate and governor races. Now in the race for Senate, Republican Governor Rick Scott has a 12,000 vote lead over incumbent Democrat Bill Nelson. The gubernatorial race is also tight with Republican Ron DeSantis ahead with 33,000 votes over Democrat Andrew Gillum. Gillum conceded on Tuesday, but has since withdrawn his concession. At least 11 people are dead from the wildfires in California. The biggest is so-called Camp Fire in North California. Nearly 7,000 structures have been destroyed. Also, there's another blaze burning in the southern part of the state. President Trump has issued an emergency declaration providing federal funding to help the affected areas. For now, I'm Ebony K. Williams and back to Waters World. With election coverage in full swing this week, politics has dominated the headlines, so we wanted to share some other news you probably missed. And with me to go over these is Fox News Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry. Good to see you. Okay, so, Ed, remember the Bo Bergdahl trade, oh, yeah. Obama trading away these five top Taliban guys out of Gitmo in exchange for the accused deserter Bo Bergdahl? President Obama assured us that the Taliban Five were being closely monitored and would not return to the battlefield. That was false. Listen to this. A Taliban spokesperson confirming that all five of the terrorists have rejoined the ranks 
and are heading back to Afghanistan. You know what? You don't remember the terms of that trade. It was the Taliban five for a terrorist to be named later. No, <laughs> it sounds like a baseball deal to me because right. it's absurd. I was at some of the news conferences when I was covering President Obama and he kept saying this is not a big deal. They're going to be monitored, as you say. They're not going back on the battlefield and that the media was making too much of it. No, it turned out to be a bogus deal. You have the terrorists back on the battlefield, number one. And number two, remember what the, uh, let's not forget what the Obama administration did. They misled us about Bo Bergdahl. Remember Susan Rice? She said he was a hero. Yes. He, he deserted. Yeah. Yes, the military. and so, very, very, very closely monitored. They have everything very and under And here control. these terrorists are back on the board. All right, next one we have China. All right, so this big trade war with the Chinese, here's an update. China blinked. President Xi promised to lower tariffs and increase imports and better protect intellectual property rights. We didn't hear anything about this last week. This is a big deal for Trump's trade war against it's China. It's huge. I would caution that a lot of the details have to be filled in. It's still in, rhetoric. One, right. right. It's rhetoric. The Chinese have to back it up. Number two, President Trump is supposed to meet with President Xi of China at the end of the month, some diplomatic talks. That's where this will be sealed, not at the beginning of the month. But, but it's a big moving of the position. But it is moving it forward. And what I would say big picture is that the president continues to not get credit from the mainstream me media about these trade policies. We've seen it with Canada, Canada Mexico, the NAFTA Europeans, deal got renegotiated. And, and everyone laughed and said this is, a, this is killing our economy. Right. He'll never get new trade deals, and he's getting them. All right. Here's an update for all you green people out there watching Waters World. After years of being told we're headed for an atmospheric apocalypse, Earth <laughs> maybe not that doomed after all. According to a UN report, the hole in the Earth's ozone layer is on the mend, expected to fully heal within 50 years. And guess what? Researchers said that the layer has recovered at a rate of 1 to 3 percent per decade since 2000. It's because America banned all those aerosol spray cans. You know when Ed Henry goes to the gym, and, he's shh, and the armpits and the hair everywhere. That you just saved it because you don't do that anymore. Uh, uh, I don't go to the gym anymore. That, yeah. Is that a shot? Uh, like, you look on. great. I'm, I'm, I'm looking trim right now. Uh, here's the bottom line. Um, I think that both sides have exaggerated. I think the president has to move towards the middle on this. He sort of says it's a hoax. There's nothing to climate change. That's not the case. But I think we've seen on the left. Huge exaggeration of the situation. If you read the actual details, it's not as bad as some are making it out to be. It's somewhere in the middle here. And, and the most important part of this report. Me now, the founder of Millennial Politics, Nathan Rubin, and director of Hispanic Engagement at Turning Points USA, Anna Paulina. So I'm doing this segment because you get a lot of heat on social media, Anna, and they say, you know, Fox News, once the election was over, you guys stopped covering the caravan. Well, Waters World is covering the caravan, and we're telling you it's continuing to head north. Why is the caravan such an important issue for you? I'd say number one, hands down, biggest issue is human trafficking. You have Polaris Hotline statistics saying that a third of human trafficking victims are coming from South America, not to mention what the ACLU put out, the State Department, the Justice Department. It's an issue. All right. So, Nathan, come on. You're... Looking at thousands of people now walking up towards the United States border. We don't know who they are. There's no way to vet them. But because of the legal loopholes in this country, once they set foot in America and they have a, someone, a child, who knows if it's their, really their child, they get to stay. So I think we do have a process for people applying for asylum. And I, I agree that we do not know who every single person is in that caravan. Um, we do know that there were as many as 10,000 people at one point in this caravan. It's now down to 6,000. They're still several hundred miles away in Mexico City. They are going to probably continue north. Whoever does make it to the border, they should have the, their legal right uh, to file for asylum. So you're OK with people crossing the border illegally? I'm OK with them coming to legal port of entry and filing for But they're asylum. not going to legal ports of entry. But it seems now that Donald Trump has made that an executive order and rejiggered the process. So what Thank I will God say is that they should have the legal right under the Refugee Act of 1980. This was established by law that people fleeing persecution, political uh, instability, they have the right to come forward. Yeah, but and, Anna, a lot of these people are not fleeing violence in their country. All of the are, interviews conducted by these caravan members say they're there for months. Money. They want to and come up here to work and then wire it back home to El Salvador. 
exactly. They were offered an ability to stay in Mexico, and they said no. So they're cutting the line, and that, that's not fair. What about, you know, I have family members in Mexico. That's not fair to them. That's well, wrong. That's Wait, exactly so if you're true, at Starbucks, we, Nathan, and someone cuts the line and you can't get your mocha frappuccino, do you say that's fine? Um, I don't usually go to Starbucks, but I, I would oh, probably... How about Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah, sure. So I, I think it's a little more complicated and nuanced than uh, an example like that. But. I don't. I thought I pretty much nailed it. All right. Let's talk <laughs> about Michelle Obama versus Donald Trump. So Michelle Obama came out with a book, and this is what it says. You ready? The whole birther thing was crazy and mean-spirited. Of course, it's underlying bigotry and xenophobia hardly concealed. But it was also dangerous, deliberately meant to stir up the wing nuts and the kooks. What if someone with an unstable mind loaded a gun and drove to Washington? What if that person went looking for our girls? Donald Trump, with his loud and reckless innuendos, was putting my family's safety at risk. And for this, I'd never forgive him. Well... Um, Donald Trump is not a forgiving person either, it looks like. He was asked about the Michelle Obama book, and here's how he responded. I guess she wrote a book. She got paid a lot of money to write a book. And they always insist that you come up with controversial. Well, I'll give you a little controversy back. I'll never forgive him for what he did to our United States military by not funding it properly. It was depleted. Everything was old and tired. And I came in and I had to fix it. And I'm in the process of spending tremendous amounts of money. So I'll never forgive him for what he did to our military. I'll never forgive him for what he did in many other ways, which I'll talk to you about in the future. All right, Anna. So neither of them is in a very forgiving mood. What do you think? First and foremost, I love Donald Trump. I think that he and what he's done for this mil military has been incredible. Not to mention, I will add that he goes to Walter Reed and visits our service members who have been hurt overseas. So for him, I give him an A-plus on that. But aside from that, Michelle Obama needs to learn something that I learned in the military called integrity. She doesn't even uphold the fact. She'll say that Trump's xenophobic. Well, her husband was forcing the exact same policies and laws. And by the way, I will add that I did have the pleasure of meeting President Trump. I am a Hispanic American, and he didn't throw his chunkla at me and a Moroccan and say, get out of the White House. So he's not xenophobic. It's ridiculous. <laughs> what do you say, Nathan? <laughs> so there, there are a couple of pieces that I really want to jump on there. First and foremost, uh, President Obama cut funding to the military as a result of the sequester. So we all remember that that was done via Congress. So he doesn't shoulder all of the blame for something like that. Um, I think for President Trump visiting people at Walter Reed, that is certainly uh, valuable and should be respected. He still, has, he still hasn't been to a combat zone yet, so President Obama has visited troops abroad, so there are these little different things. I think the combat zones in the White House, by the way, that these press people <laughs> but, pull grenades no, on. No, no, that, that, that's fair. The troops didn't even want Obama there. Obama in you know, combat, that's a joke. <laughs> All right. I'm serious. I'm serious about that. Well, I, I do want to talk about the book, for example, because I think Michelle Obama, you know, now that she's out of the White House, she yes. was the first African-American first lady. She certainly has a right to speak and a right to write about whatever she would like. Um, I think well, she suffered a lot of I want to read Trump's book in, uh, well, in six years from now, Nathan. I think that book's <laughs> going to be uh, a hot seller, probably sell a little more copies than Michelle Obama. Yeah, we'll All right, Anna Paulina, I got to run. Thank you, Nathan. Thank I gotta, you. Take care of some business. Coming up next, are you single? Porter, you may get a little resistance when trying to find a date. So my next guest created a new dating app named Donald Daters that's specifically tailored just for Trump voters. Joining me now, the founder of Donald Daters, Emily Moreno, and Jared Barker, who has signed up to find love. All right, Emily, did you create this because you saw that people that supported Donald Trump might be having trouble in the dating world? I did. You know, I saw a real need for this. People that go on the mainstream apps like Tinder and Bumble, they're told if you're a Trump supporter, swipe left. Oh, so if you're going on a regular dating app and people find out you like Trump, they're just going to diss you and you got no shot. Absolutely. So this is you've created an environment just for Donald Trump supporters like Jared Barker, who is a sign up person. He's now participating. Jared, have you found any love connection as a Donald dater? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I've had a few matches. Obviously, it's only been out a few weeks, so haven't gone any dates yet. But um, yeah, it looks promising. All right. So you have found other Trump supporters that you've matched with online. How does that work? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you go through an app just like any other kind of dating app, swipe left, swipe right, uh, obviously depending on your preference. And then um, if you get matched up with the other person, you can start talking from there. Did you talk to them about the wall? <laughs> absolutely. The first things out of my mouth is build that wall. Depending what, on their response. And what did she say? What, and, and who's going to pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> but that would be I on mean, Bumble, not Donald Daters. <laughs> right, right. I mean, they could have a field day with this thing. So this is financially successful so far. Has the president congratulated you on uh, all of your love connections? The president has not endorsed this yet, but we're hoping that he's watching this and he'll be supportive. The president always watches Waters World. Do you find that there could be problems, though? What if there was a secret liberal who was signing up and was going on there to expose these people and to make fun of these people and then shame them online afterwards after there was an embarrassing date? Do you see a risk there? Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, the liberals right now, they're unhinged. And of course, they're going to see this and they're going to want to attack people like Jared that are on here to, to find true love. Are you on the Donald Daters? So I actually have a boyfriend and for it's nice thing for me as politics has never affected our relationship. And the nice we put politics aside and focus on what really makes a strong relationship, which isn't about who you vote for every four years. Do you think that having political similarities is key to finding love in the Trump era? I think that politics and love is definitely, you can have politics and love if you choose to, but with Donald Daters, what we offer is you don't have to just talk politics. And on a lot of these mainstream apps, it becomes a deal breaker. And the way I see it is it should be an icebreaker. Oh, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jared, when no. you're online and you're in the Donald Daters scene, would you not even consider dating a Hillary supporter? You're just interested.